Thank you, Russ, uh, Uma, and I want to thank uh, the organizers as well. So, um, my topic is first-line therapy, and that has a lot of different uh, considerations. First-line therapy for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis should be a proactive and personalized IBD approach. And this needs to be based on not only disease activity, but as we heard in the first session, disease severity and risk. So from this point forward, we should not only be considering the current disease activity of our patients, but disease activity and as Corey beautifully outlined, disease severity, and as Jean-Fred uh, pointed out, disease burden. We want to consider early intervention therapy we want to consider individualizing induction and maintenance uh, therapy and proactive therapeutic drug monitoring. And a lot of these topics are going to be discussed later uh, in this session. We want to differentiate early on low severity and low risk, uh, which includes uh, low disease activity, localized anatomic extent, normal labs, normal biomarkers, normal imaging, as well as uh, mild endoscopic features. And then also consider high risk, and that's moderate disease activity, moderate to severe disease activity, but also severe um, um, uh, burden, severe disease burden. And this includes extensive disease, ileocolitis, deep ulcers, anemia on presentation, high CRP, high SED rate, fistula on presentation, early age of onset, or potential early need for steroids. So again, you're gonna have all this information, and I'm not going to go through all of the details uh, for you, but this lists all of the treatments uh, that are FDA approved for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and I'll be going through um, the aminosalicylates, briefly the antibiotics, corticosteroids, immunomodulators, and biologics. So uh, traditionally, as we've heard, we've had a step-up therapy approach for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and we started out especially with UC with five ASA agents, and then with more disease activity using steroids, immunologic uh, agents, and biologics. But uh, especially if we consider uh, the topics in the earlier session where patients have high disease severity which is equivalent to high risk, we want to consider inverting the pyramid. And that is using our best agents first, using biologics first in combination with immunomodulators, uh, biologics, and other things. So we want to consider this treatment uh, uh, pyramid and algorithm uh, uh, on the left, mild to moderate activity, which is low risk, and those individuals can uh, proceed with a, a step-up approach. But on the right, if we have patients who have moderate to severe disease activity at presentation or early on and have high disease severity because of anemia, high CRP, imaging, abnormalities, et cetera, then they're high risk. And we want to use, again, biologic therapy early on. So let's look at the mild to moderate uh, category at this juncture, and this is a classification of UC severity, mild disease, less than four stools, moderate disease, more than four. And these are common agents that you see in the upper half of this slide that are accepted for this. And it includes mesalamine in the range of 1.5 to 4.8 grams a day, valsalazide, sulfasalazine, four to six grams a day, and especially for those with rectal symptoms or severe rectal disease, considering uh, rectal ASAs, either suppositories or enemas, or steroid equivalents. Um, this is a slide which highlights the different release sites and different release mechanisms of five ASAs. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that while mesalamine is all alike, the delivery mechanisms are different and certain patients will do better with one than the other. This slide looks at um, delayed release um, mesalamine and shows that, at least in this study, 2.4 grams and 4.8 grams were pretty equivalent as far as dose response and efficacy at week eight. 
Whereas this study uh, showed that with, del again, delayed release uh, mesalamine uh, in those with moderate ulcerative colitis versus those with only mild to moderate, those in, with moderate uh, did benefit from 4.8 grams a day more so than 2.4. First-line therapy for mild to moderate distal ulcerative colitis should uh, include combination therapy, certainly rectal therapy. And this is data from uh, SAFTI showing that with combination therapy, there was cessation of rectal bleeding at a mean of 12 days versus 25 days with oral uh, mesalamine or rectal mesalamine alone. Safety considerations do exist for the five ASAs. Nephrotoxicity is rare, but does occur. The FDA does recommend periodic monitoring of renal function, and this should be done either at six or 12 month intervals, depending on the situation, and one should consider checking a urinalysis uh, as well. Other options for first-line therapy in mild to moderate ulcerative colitis includes budesonide MMX, and this has been showed to achieve a combined clinical and endoscopic remission at week eight. It's only one pill a day. It's uh, uh, well covered and so should be considered as uh, a treatment option. Other first-line therapy in distal mild to moderate ulcerative colitis should include budesonide foam, which is effective for mild to moderate ulcerative proctitis and proctosigmoiditis, as shown in these two studies. Now, looking at Crohn's disease, the National Cooperative Crohn's Disease Study first really demonstrated in a, a careful way the efficacy of prednisone uh, in Crohn's disease at 16 weeks, and there was borderline efficacy with sulfasalazine and azathioprine versus uh, placebo. Antibiotics are used and have been studied uh, in Crohn's disease, but their tolerability has always been an issue, as you'll see in the next uh, study. This is a study by uh, Sutherland from the 1990s and showed uh, on the right that in colonic Crohn's, uh, metronidazole did seem to be effective, but there are only eight, eight subjects that could finish the study. It was effective in earlier colonic Crohn's, but not in all comers. And there was just a huge drop eight, dropout in this study, uh, uh, which was truly uh, problematic. First-line therapy in mild to moderate uh, Crohn's disease also includes ileal release of uh, budesonide. And this is a study uh, by Rutgers uh, from the 1990s that showed that budesonide was pretty effective in uh, controlling mild to moderate Crohn's disease. Prednisolone was a little more effective, but as you'll see here, the side effect profile of prednisolone was more of an issue, and this showed the safety of uh, budesonide was much uh, better. So cortic corticosteroids, prednisone, prednisolone, the systemic steroids are very effective, but we have to minimize their use because of the laundry list of side effects as shown here. Immunomodulators are options for induction therapy, but they are really too slow to be effective and should only be considered uh, for maintenance. And, and again, uh, uh, Gil will be talking more about these. Very briefly, this is uh, just uh, one slide shows that, that shows that in early Crohn's disease, with risk factors for disabling disease, early azathioprine was not uh, uh, effective in reducing the need for surgery, steroids, or anti-TNF therapy. So this is... Um, a helpful summary slide, which uh, you may want to refer back to in the future, showing options for biologic therapy in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And these agents should be considered, as we heard earlier, as first-line options in moderate to severe or in high-risk IBD. So for anti-TNF therapies, we have infliximab, adalimumab, sertolizumab, pegol, and golimumab. And I have listed uh, here uh, the induction schedules, the maintenance schedules, as well as dose escalation schedules. Uh, and when shaded, those are not FDA approved. 
Also included is the anti-integrin uh, vetalizumab, uh, the standard uh, induction and maintenance schedule, and the dose escalation option, where there's been a lot of experience. And the newly uh, approved ustekinumab, where there's a single IV dose, and then sub-Q maintenance. So first-line therapy in uh, steroid, uh, naive, immunomodulator naive, anti-TNF naive, moderate to severe Crohn's disease, as Dr. Rubin presented earlier, includes early combined immunosuppression and also conventional management. And when this was studied, uh, it was um, uh, used as infliximab at 0, 2, and 6 plus immunomodulators versus starting out with steroids, and then followed for two years. And I, I won't go into detail about the data, but there was um, uh, superiority as far as endoscopic healing with early combined immunosuppression and also combo uh, reduced steroid use. So uh, then we came up with a sonic study which uh, supports first-line anti-TNF therapy to achieve corticosteroid-free clinical remission and mucosal healing in an anti-TNF uh, naive, immunomodulator naive, early Crohn's population. And this shows the benefits of combination over infliximab and over azathioprine. And this is a, a sub-analysis looking at only those with elevated CRP and ulcers at baseline endoscopy. And this shows an even more amplified effect of combination therapy over azathioprine. Both the CHARM, adalimumab, and the precise two sertolizumab pegol studies support first-line anti-TNF therapy uh, for those with shorter disease duration. And what you see here with the uh, CHARM study is a 59% remission rate for those with less than two years disease duration, a 68% remission rate for uh, uh, sertolizumab uh, pegol when it was less than one year disease duration. The pediatric REACH study demonstrated the same thing. Very high response, 88%, and remission rates in those with uh, early onset young age uh, uh, patients. And uh, the latest approved agent, uh, ustekinumab, is a potential first-line agent also, as seen over on the right, with week eight efficacy uh, rates in a primarily anti-TNF naive population of 40%, with very good safety at eight weeks, and also uh, uh, good results at uh, uh, week 52. Accelerated infliximab dosing is first-line therapy in severe hospitalized UC patients. And this is a retrospective analysis of 50 hospitalized severe acute UC patients, 35 of whom received standard infliximab dosing at 0, 2, and 6, and 15 received accelerated uh, dosing over only 24 days. And in those who had standard induction, there was a 40% colectomy rate. Those who received accelerated induction, only a 6.7% uh, uh, percent colectomy rate. And so this has really uh, set the uh, mark for infliximab as first-line therapy for severe acute UC. But there is no unanimity uh, regarding infliximab rescue dosing. And this is a survey among IV experts. And uh, there was no agreement, but there are some dosing schedules as aggressive that has, have been used, as aggressive as 10 weeks per keg at 0, 2, and 6. But in truth, what we need to do in 2016 in 2017 is, if using this approach, utilize therapeutic drug monitoring as well. Vedalizumab is another option for first-line therapy in moderate to severe UC, and this is very good data at week 6 and also at week 6 and 52. So what about safety? Well, I already mentioned uh, renal issues with mesalamine. There's the potential for infection and lymphoma with immunomodulators. You'll hear a lot more about that from Gil. Anti-TNF therapy considers considerations about monotherapy and dual therapy. Vedalizumab therapy, rel relatively uh, safe. Uh, but if we add dual therapy, perhaps more concerns. And ustekinumab, uh, perhaps infection and skin cancer long term. So in, in conclusion, different strategies exist for first-line therapies. Proactive and personalized treatment is key. 
one needs to choose the best agent for the assessed disease activity and disease severity. Prognostic factors are important to determine the best approach to treatment. Careful disease assessment and therapeutic drug monitoring improve outcomes, and of course, we still have a need for new agents in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Thank you very much.